song had a dependency clause. Did you hear it? If what? Oh, I'm not hearing enough of that. What's a dependency clause? Boy, wouldn't it be great if we could get that? All of us. Do you think that uh, faith will change your life? Do you think that faith will change the world? If you trust him? That's not how it's written here, but that's what I heard just a minute ago. Do you think faith will change the world, will change your life for the better? Yes? Maybe? Well, I don't know for sure. I don't want to go there. Which is it? What do you think? What do you think? Yes? Okay. We got, we got a yes. How much emphasis do you put on your faith? each day, each and every day. How much do you expect to be different yourself or for others to be different? How much do you expect that? That they will be different because they have faith. How much does your faith affect other people? How much does other people's faith affect you? Now think about this church. Think about your friends here. Think about other friends in the faith. How many times have they influenced you? Have they ever influenced you? Where they've said something or they've said, um, challenged you? Well, I think you should do this. Maybe forgive somebody. Or I think you should go on and do what you're going to do. Or, you know, have they challenged you to, to take an extra step in your faith out of your comfort zone? Ever? Anybody? And it matters, doesn't it? Because you probably wouldn't do it yourself if you didn't have that encouragement. So their faith has affected you and your faith affects them. Right? I know it's happened to me time and time again. I'm glad it's happened to you. C.S. Lewis wrote this. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, all the clergy, all the missions, all the sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. Because man, God made man for no other purpose. No other purpose goes right back up for nothing else but to draw men into Christ to be little Christ. So Paul was drawing his friend Philemon into Christ to become a little Christ. Thank you for that reading. Appreciate it. It was very clear. Now you might be a little shocked about this letter, are you? What kind of subject matter is this? It's an, and it's a personal issue. It's a personal letter from one man to another, kind of a father in the faith to his son, not really his son, fellow believer in the faith. It's very personal. It's got a really hard subject matter. And so we wonder, why was it included in the Bible? It's a letter about a runaway slave to the man Philemon. And Philemon was, um, he had this problem. And so really, when you have this kind of problem, shouldn't Paul have been just denouncing slavery? Shouldn't Paul have been addressing this issue? Why should one man have another man? Typically in that time, it's because that man owed money and they would be enslaved because they owed money or they'd be enslaved because they were conquered by another nation. But that is not why this man was enslaved. He was enslaved probably because he owed money. And so you might be just a little shocked at this subject matter is in the Bible, but not addressed. There's a lot of wrong things in the world that the Bible doesn't address directly, but the Bible does address them all indirectly. And so we're going to look for that today in this. For example, Paul wrote in Colossians, you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Okay, so he's addressing 
issues of slavery with that statement. He's addressing the Christian reality that no one is diminished, that all, and when it says all men are created equal, it means all mankind. So it's not being racist. It's saying all mankind, no matter what race, male, female, they're all created equal. Have you heard that somewhere before? All men are created equal. Anybody heard that before? Okay, they are endowed by their who? Creator with certain unalienable rights. Wow, maybe the writers had read this. Though Paul doesn't directly criticize slavery, he's changing society's view of slavery. That's what he's doing with those verses. He's changing it from within by challenging people through Philemon's story. So we're going to hear this story about relationship between someone who owned another human being and that changed their attitude. Paul did that. Paul changed their attitude. Paul changed Philemon's attitude because he's writing to him. He changed everybody who's reading the letter, which includes us, because every generation has to be changed. Every generation has to be challenged in their faith. So are you seeing through a lens of equality in the Christian faith? We just need to ask ourselves that every once in a while. The Christian faith is filled with a variety of people, a plethora of talents, all kinds of um, um, gifts that people have. None are inferior. None at all are inferior. You know why? Another thing we know to say that statement for we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I think they need a gift card to Dairy Queen for that. Just like the kids. You know it. You know that verse. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're all on the equal playing field. We're all level. But what did God do? I mean, if we've all fallen short, we all sin, what hope is there? So God just stepped right in and in grace allowed for us to have salvation through faith. So God wasn't hindered by our sins. He sacrificed to overcome them, and he made salvation accessible. So Paul went around bearing this message all over the place, all over Asia. He went into all these towns. He went all throughout Israel or the area, and he started numerous churches, and one of the towns he went to was Ephesus. And so he, another man went to Ephesus, and this man heard Paul speak and got to know Paul in Ephesus, and got to hear Paul's message. And this man was very wealthy. His name was Philemon. And he went into that town. Maybe he was on a business trip, and he went there, and there's a revival meeting. Only they weren't reviving. They were starting for the first time. And he decided to go. Maybe it was the evening, and that was his entertainment. And he decided he was going to go hear this man, Paul. And he did, and he got saved when he heard him. And he became a Christian. He met Jesus at night. Now what? What does he do? Well, he went back home to Colossia. How would Jesus, how would his new friend Paul, affect him, impact him? How would other believers impact his life? He was just really a new believer. Well, he decided to open his home to the church. And the church at Colossia met at his house on a regular basis. And they probably had sermons that were much longer than mine. Maybe even three hours. But young men don't get any ideas. So, Philemon had a slave named Onesimus. That may name, the meaning of that name is useful or profitable. 
However, he was not being useful. In fact, Philemon called him useless. That's how he referred to him, as useless. And in fact, um, his attitude was less than the best. We're a little premature on this picture here, so just don't look at it yet. And so he had on his mind, and he had a quest for freedom. He did not like being in bondage, and so he made it finally to the place where he ran away on the funds of Philemon. So he stole from him and then took off, and he ended up in Rome. And he was in Rome and was a fugitive, and somehow Paul, who was also in Rome, imprisoned and he met. Somehow they came across each other. Now, I don't know. There we have it. And, um, you know, we have a, a um, fugitive who's down. I mean, he looks like he's uh, hit the bottom, right? We don't know if that's what happened, but perhaps he hit bottom. Perhaps he knew about Paul's visit to Ephesus and Paul's impact on his owner. And perhaps that's why he sought Paul out. But somehow they came together. This kind of smacks of God's work when you think about it. How did these two get together? How would he, I mean, you think he would go near a prison being a runaway slave? Oh, no, you wouldn't think so. So that's why it smacks of God's work, because God cares about people. God cares about relationships. God cares about what happens in our circumstances. And so here he is. He ends up there in prison with Paul because of God's overriding providence that led him there. And so there he is. He encounters Paul. Now, what kind of person was Paul? How did Paul live his life? Paul was driven. Every word out of Paul's mouth went to bring people to Christ. That was his mission, his purpose in life. He had given up everything to do that. So do you think when Onesimus went to visit with him, Paul said, Hi, how you doing? This is terrible that I'm in jail. Probably not. He probably said, Hi, how you doing? Jesus loves you. Let me tell you about it. And don't mind these chains. I know they make noise. That's probably what he did. And guess what? You already know. Onesimus is saved. He comes to know Jesus right there in that jail cell. And so he's hanging out with Paul. He's drawn to Paul. He becomes a believer. So soon he becomes Paul's helper. Soon he becomes more than Paul's helper. He becomes Paul's servant. He does everything for Paul. Onesimus is transformed. He's changed. He used to be useless. Now he's useful. Ephesians explains God's vision like this. It's a vision for bringing people together because you see you now have a man in chains, a man who has been in chains that's fugitive, and there they are together. Typically, they would not. They would be hostile toward each other. But Jesus has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Paul is changing attitudes of diverse groups of people. Here in particular, slave and free. Because God's love, when it's allowed to flourish, when it's allowed to be the center of your life, affects others in a positive way. You know, when I was writing this message, I just got a wild thought. I'll just share it with you and don't get mad. What if in our political parties this happened? You know, we should have Christians in both political parties. What if they became little Christs 
and the dividing wall of hostility? What if the little Christ began working with Paul's attitude change? If they love Jesus more, they could be leaders in drawing all those people together. Seems impossible, doesn't it? As, po as impossible as that seems, that's what's happening in this chapter. Okay, these were two entirely different groups of people hostile to each other. That's how your love for God affects others. Paul's love for God affected these people. But you notice, if you followed, that Paul had to persuade Philemon. It took a little work to convince him. This attitude doesn't come naturally. We don't have it naturally. I don't have it. I can tell you, didn't have it yesterday. Came home, read that last night, and I'm like, oh, this message hits home. It hits home. Paul does not demand that Philemon do this. He says that because that's not God's way. God doesn't demand that we get this. We must decide for ourselves to let love flourish. Paul said, I could be bold and I could order you to do this. I could. That's what he said. I, I, I could order to do what you should do. But instead, I prefer to simply ask you. Because you have to decide to let God's love flourish within you. So, he's asking Phil, Philemon to overlook bad behavior. Now, here's what Philemon experienced. He, feel, he experienced like a bad worker who comes late to work, leaves early, calls in sick every Monday, doesn't do his share of the work, and then steals from the company. That's what he's dealing with. Or, like the student who comes late to every class, who has buds in his ears or her ears, who doesn't listen, doesn't do their homework, never turns it in if they do it, and doesn't care. That's the kind of person, boy, frustrating people, right? So he's talking about one frustrating person, but that person has changed. That person is a new creation. His conversion has been real. His change of heart has been activated, and it's in his relationships. And so Paul saw not the rough draft of Onesimus before, but he's seeing the transformed person. Now, I imagine he saw the transformed person before he was transformed, don't you? He saw the transformed person when he was still the rough draft. Is there a person in your life who's a real problem, like Onesimus? Is there? Probably. Okay, if there's not, there will be tomorrow. Okay, do you have no hope for this person? Because you're seeing the rough draft, and it's not pretty. You're seeing the rough draft, and it might be a mess. Perhaps you should pray that your love will begin to affect him. Your love for God will begin to affect him. Your love for Jesus will begin to affect them. You don't know God, how God will do it, but your job as a believer is to allow your love for God to override everything. Just live in that tension for just a minute. Your job is to allow your love for God to just override everything. Paul did not see Onesimus as useless. Even though he was useless when he showed up, Paul didn't see that. To Paul, here's this man who comes to Christ. He sees him as a son. So at that moment, that becomes his son. He hangs out at the prison. You might say that this young man began doing prison ministry. Right there, he kind of just organically grew into it. 
And t soon he became, Paul became, totally comforted by this useless man. Paul's totally comforted. Paul's so comforted he wants him to stay. Think of your worst person and think of somebody wanting them to stay because they're such a blessing. Isn't that hope? Isn't that hope? What did, we, what did they sing? I am that I am. I have all power. Okay? If you'll only... If you'll only... Oh, man, that hard T word. <laughs> so Onesimus changed everything due to Christ. So Paul asked Philemon to take him back. He was willing to keep him himself. That didn't help much, so he said, I, I want you to take him back, and I don't want you to treat him not as a slave. I don't want you to treat him as a slave. I want you to treat him as a brother. Wow, this is tough stuff. This is really hard. How am I going to do that? Paul said, I'll pay his debt. I mean, Paul, that's a little pressure. That's a little pressure. Okay, if you're going to pay his debt, if you love him that much, I suppose I can take him back. I mean, it could have been just as reluctant as that. But you know what? When he did that, he stepped into this place. There's no Jew or Greek, circumcised or uncircumcised, no slave or free. He just stepped into that place. He, a, a slave owner just changed the image of people. Just changed. So Paul says this is most important. How important, do you ask? Remember, Philemon, you owe me your very self. I wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord that will refresh my heart in Christ. So think of your most difficult person. Can that person have some benefit from you that will refresh their entire life? There's the point of faith and trust right there for us. There's the point. And we can begin by saying, God, I'm going to do this. Help me. Because I don't see it right now. Now, how does your love for God affect others? Can it produce change? Here's the rest of the story. There was a man that lived, he was born in, uh, in A.D. 35, so he, and he died into the second century. So he was writing about this time. The time of this letter is about A.D. 60. And so he was named Ignatius. Some of you Bible scholars know about Ignatius. Uh, he was a bishop of Antioch, and he wrote letters to the churches. He was an early church father, and so he wrote these letters. One of the letters he wrote was to Ephesus. And we know there's connection here. And in that letter, he mentions Onesimus. Here's the rest of the story. I receive the welcome of your congregation in the name of God through Onesimus. A man, listen how he's described, Onesimus, a man of inexpressible love, and your bishop in the flesh, whom I pray you by Jesus Christ to love. Love your bishop. And that you would all seek to be like him. Wow. And blessed be he who has granted unto you to obtain such an excellent bishop. Useless, slave, saved, learning, growing, pastor, bishop, leading others, inexpressible love. Wow. The power of God. So how do you measure a person? By their bad behavior? 
by their political party, by their failures. When we have hope in someone like Jesus, that he can turn that person into something entirely different through our love for that person, our love for God. Because our love for God has to come first. We're not going to automatically love somebody else until we get that love satisfied in God. So are you letting that love of God well up in you, receiving it for yourself, giving it out? God can do amazing things. Do you expect to be different? Do you expect others to be different? How much does your faith affect others? Amen.